Thank you for those kind words. Uh, friends, let me begin by <coughs> recognizing on the dais Professor Mahesh Bhattar, Professor Dikubhai Patel, Professor Mohan Patel, <coughs> Professor Kalamkar, <coughs> Dr. J.D. Bhattar. And let me begin by saying uh, uh, what a wonderful feeling it is uh, for me to be here in Anand. This is my first visit. Um, and uh, let me also say that in addition to the gentlemen sitting on the dais, I have to recognize my very good and old friend, Professor Pandya, sitting before me, I have to recognize him because our association <coughs> goes back many years. And of course, I know some other individuals. I'm not going to elaborate further. <coughs> now, um, I have been asked to speak about uh, Dr. Anji Patel, and this is a lecture in his memory. Um, it is uh, Professor Mohan Patel who first asked me to deliver this lecture. To be honest, I actually almost declined. In fact, I did decline. I was not uh, prepared to uh, say yes to it. For the reason that <clears throat> I actually never really knew uh, Dr. I.G. Patel. For all the eminence, uh, that he had. Uh, unfortunately, I never really knew him. Um, I have been in Delhi for uh, 50 years now. I, I'm from Orissa. I went to Delhi as an undergraduate student. Um, first to Kironiman College to do my BA and then 69 I joined the Delhi School of Economics to do my Masters. So, uh, if not for 50, even during my BA days, uh, I was familiar with major economists coming to the Delhi School of Economics. Even as an undergraduate, I remember we used to go to because D School is just opposite. There's just a road that separates Kiriman College from Delhi School of Economics. So I remember as an undergraduate student of economics honors, walking down, because these were all free sessions. I've heard Joan Robinson, I've heard Yalin Kukmans, I've heard many other figures, even as an undergraduate in Kirodimal College. And I used to have a great teacher, Arun Bose, a very well-known economist, also of Cambridge, the very place I.G. Patil went and studied. And uh, Bose used to, uh, Professor Bose used to encourage us and my friends to uh, attend these uh, sessions. So that's how I was familiar with these very major names. But somehow, uh, though these were also the years in which Dr. R.G. Patel <coughs> was very prominent in India and in the international arena, I never had the good fortune of really uh, getting to know him in any way, but with a caveat. I heard him once, I heard him once, in the beginning 1980s. In the late 1980s, uh, I, um, after MA, I had gone off to the US to do my PhD, as was mentioned by my dear friend here. Then I returned, <coughs> and my first job was in the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. The institute was just getting opened in the year 1976, and the first director, founding director, was Dr. Raja Chalaya. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, I was looking for a job. I got a job in Hyderabad, Administrative Staff College of India. I didn't take it up. I wanted to be in Delhi, etc. That's not important, not relevant also. But I joined an IPFP. So it was uh, a place where uh, I got started. I was, the, I think, the very first economist to join the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, 1976. Radha Chalaya had just started the institute. But there was no uh, physical place for the institute. I was the first person to join it. Dr. Chalaya was already a high-level consultant in the Ministry of Finance. He had come from IMF, Washington DC, just for a year. And uh, 
the then finance minister, Subramanian, some of you might remember the name, he was an agriculture minister and then he was a close um, confidant of uh, uh, Madam Indira Gandhi, Shrimati Indira Gandhi, Subramanian. And Subramanian, the finance minister, had assured uh, Raja Chandra that yes, he will give some funding for NIPFP. So, uh, institute got started. Dr. Chalaya had an office in Yojana Bhavan uh, and uh, one in Finance Ministry. So when he used to sit in the Finance Ministry, we used to, one, me and another friend who just joined, we used to go to Yojana Bhavan. And when he would go to Yojana Bhavan, we, we used to go to the Finance Ministry. That's how it was. So we got started. Then there were many episodes, uh, not uh, important to re relate here, but then <coughs> It had some temporary premises in Rajendra place, anybody familiar with Delhi. But in 81, NIPFP had a brand new spanking new building. And uh, Professor Chadha was a very um, stickler for doing things in a proper way. He wanted to construct the building in a nice way. And he was keen to have a building in the format of the IMF building. Anybody who knows the IMF building or knows about it, it's a squarish building with, a, with an open courtyard in the middle. And he wanted that structure for NIPFP. And anyone familiar with NIPFP will know that there's a courtyard in, in between. He wanted to do that and he gave a very nice stone exterior to it. All of this in 1981. But who should be the individuals opening on the opening session of an IPFP brand new building? Well, I.G. Patel was the person. And there were a few others also. But I remember this occasion because of the sheer brilliance of I.G. Patel's talk. It was extraordinarily brilliant. Many people spoke because it was an important occasion. Raja Chalaya was there. Many other individuals were there, Monte Carlo Adia was there, and so forth and so on. But IG was asked to speak. He, of course, in his usual way, he came and spoke for hardly 10 minutes. But he put the house in, into, with his wit, people were laughing, and then he was also pungent and talking about the economy and everything else. That's how I remember IG Patel, those 10 minutes. So when I was first asked, to speak, I was very hesitant, but then finally, after a couple of uh, uh, goadings, and he also told me that Alat Nandaji has uh, specially said that you must come. And I do know Alat Nandaji, and more than that, Madam Alat Nanda's younger brother was my teacher at the Delhi School of Economics. He's a formidable economist. He's Sir Partha, that is Partha Das Gupta, in Cambridge University. Um, so, uh, he's still there, still active, and uh, a major economist uh, in today's times. If you think of climate change, the most important work is by Parthadas Gupta. You just have to Google Parthadas Gupta, uh, and uh, there it is. So, <clears throat> uh, finally, I did say it, so and here goes. So, this is a lecture. I'll try to keep to the time still, because my lecture is supposed to end at 11.10. And I'm starting maybe 30, 20 minutes after, but still, let's see how it goes. And I'll try to close as quickly as is possible. And I believe my lecture has been given to people. So uh, I don't really have to go through all of it. You can just read it. Uh, so I will not uh, sort of poach on the other time of this morning. <clears throat> so I've decided to talk on revisiting India's growth. And I think this is ultimately what was crucial to IG as a, a trained economist and as a person who was getting into India in the immediate years after India's independence. IG wanted to bring about whatever could be brought about by way of improving and increasing the pace of growth of this country with social justice, with social justice and of course also with low inflation, that was very important in IG's mind also, because he he was also he was not uh, as um, sort of uh, generous in terms of growth only, even with inflation.
situation. No, he was strict about that aspect. So that is the thing about IG's personality. You see many Indian economists taking a position that, you know, growth for growth's sake doesn't matter if we have deficit finance. IG was not like that. And if you read IG's writings, you will see that he was very careful about not having a, um, an inflationary sort of element in the growth process. Growth with justice, with low inflation. Broadly, that was IG's philosophy. So I decided to talk about revisiting India's growth. So here goes. So we'll see how, it, how we are able to revisit in India's growth. I deem it a great honor to have been asked by the Gujarat Economic Association to deliver this year's IG Patil Memorial Lecture. Indra Prasad Gordhan Bhai Patel, 1924-2005, was one of the foremost economists of post-independent India. He had a brilliant academic career Topping in his bachelor's examination in the University of Bombay before going on to King's College, Cambridge in 1944, <clears throat> where he remained till 1949 to earn his doctorate, barring a year 1947-48, which he spent at Harvard. IG, as he was known to one and all, began his illustrious career as an academic in Baroda College, Bombay University, 1949-50. He then went on to work in the IMF, 1950-54, and then much later for UNDP, 1972-77, and held some of the highest positions of economic decision making in the Indian government. He was the chief economic advisor, 1961-66, Seven, Secretary of Economic Affairs in the Ministry of Finance, 67-72, and the Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, 77-82. That's when I saw him, he was visiting the NIPFP building. Subsequently, he served briefly as the Director of the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad during 82-84, after which he held the high-profile position of Director of the London School of Economics during 1984, 1990. Anji was known for his formidable intellectual powers, sharp wit, and quick repartee. And in his long career, had mingled with some of the finest economic minds across the world. <coughs> Sir Austin Robinson, husband of June Robinson. <coughs> of Cambridge, Sir Austin Robinson of Cambridge, thought of IG as his best duty. There's a tutorial system of Cambridge University, so uh, Sir Austin Robinson thought of IG as his best duty over his, that is Robinson's, entire tenure at, as fellow of King's College Cambridge. IG put down some of his experiences in his book, Glimpses of Indian Economic Policy, an Insider's View, published in 2002, in the twilight years of his life. <clears throat> he died in 2005, so three years prior to that. The book was written <clears throat> entirely from memory, without any access to official documents. He states it right in the beginning of the book. It provides interesting and some fascinating vignettes of several key events in his life in the highest echelons of Indian bureaucracy. <coughs> IG had worked quite closely with Finance Minister C. D. Deshmukh, T. T. Krishnamachari, and Murarji Desai. He was particularly close to Desai, so he was thought to be a Desai man. And for that reason, even though he worked with Shrimati Indira Gandhi, Indira Gandhi never used to it's known, and he has also acknowledged, she never used to trust IG fully, though she had a working relationship with IG, because after all, he was the finance secretary um, uh, in, in the Ministry of Finance. He was the secretary in the Ministry of Finance, Department of Economic Affairs. She worked with IG, but there was a certain degree of, for the reason that IG was regarded to be a very close 
person to Moraji Desai. That's, that's the context. And also with Sachin Chaudhary, uh, Y.B. Chavan, H.M. Patel, Charan Singh, H.M. Bahogna, all these people. I.G. had worked with all of these people. R. Venkatraman, who later became president, Pranam Mukherjee, all of whom he gratefully acknowledges, gave him his due and a great deal of affection over the years. I.G. had personal acquaintance of Pandit Nehru, Lal Bahadur Shastri and Shrimati Indira Gandhi. Also, this is true. That I.G. was a consummate civil servant and policy maker was well recognized by all. But where was he in terms of his ideology? On being pressed by a journalist to answer this when he was the NSC director, I.G.'s response was the following, <clears throat> I'm quoting. I said that if I had to describe myself, I would call myself an old-fashioned socialist, he says. I could as well have said that I was an old-fashioned liberal. What I meant was that I was not a Marxist socialist opposed to markets and private property. But I was not a card-carrying capitalist either and was supportive of certain values like compassion, and justice in all social and economic arrangements. I.G. Patel. There's an interesting episode described in Patel, this book that I'm talking about, 2002. I, I very strongly suggest this to at least some of the young faculty members and students who have not read this book. Please pick it up. It'll be there in your library. You can read it. It's, it's a racy read. It's a racy read. So you see an aspect of IG's perspective on ethical issues. <clears throat> the event occurs in 1965, when India's economic standing was possibly at its lowest step against the backdrop of the disastrous 1962 war with China and the continuing conflict with Pakistan, which led to a war in 1965. India's food and foreign exchange levels were particularly vulnerable. Anyone senior enough sitting here will know that the years 66 and 67 were extremely bad years for India. Okay. IG was at a conference in Washington DC and a Russian delegate asked him why he thought that a country like the Soviet Union had an obligation to assist India. During those days, in 66-67, food grains were also in very low supply. India actually went to not just the US, we got the PL480 wheat and all of that. This, that's well known. But India had also gone to countries like Italy and such others begging for some food. Our position was very bad internationally. And when you do this kind of, uh, you have to beg for food, it, it, it reflects on your own self-image also. That is the setting. And this is a setting in which India was going around trying to get foreign aid and things like that. So that that's the setting. Year is 1965. So this Russian delegate asks him why he thought that a country like the Soviet Union had an obligation to assist India. IG's response was as follows. <clears throat> he says, I'm quoting, I was, a, I was at a loss what to say and replied tongue in cheek that I was the only Hindu in the room and believed in life after death. Since this can neither be proved nor disproved, the probability of life after death can be taken as one in two. Okay. Since two thirds of the world was poor, there was one in three chances that my Russian friend might be born in his mind this, this is compound probability, so it's exactly right, what he says, 1 in 3, eight, you work it out, it's a minor exercise. Uh, it is, this is, the probability aspect is exactly correct, I checked it. Since two thirds of the world was poor, there was 1 in 3 chances that my Russian friend might be born in his next life in Zambia or India, in a poor country. Does it not make sense for him to ensure his future by doing something in this life 
which might make Zambia or India better places to live in after say 30 or 40 years. Everyone laughed. I'm quoting for it. But I was told many years later that I had in fact anticipated John Rawls's argument for altruism. Okay, that was IG. Uh, Rawls had been expounding, this is end port of IG, and then I have this to say. Rawls had been expounding on his ideas through the 1950s and wrote his seminal work, A Theory of Justice in 1971, which has had a profound impact on all subsequent considerations of the notions of fairness and justice. When a rational agent makes a choice about a state of the world at a future date, behind the veil of ignorance, not knowing precisely where he or she should be in the new dispensation, there is a good reason to expect that moral agents will behave so as to maximize the well-being of the worst off individual. This would be true both in a static setting as well as in a dynamic intergenerational setting, providing an ethical rationale to the present day agents to place curbs on their exploitation of natural resources in consideration for the future generations of our children and grandchildren. In an interesting variation, IG turns the issue of intergenerational equity into a context of the Hindu notion of rebirth. This was not the Rawlsian notion of intergenerational equity, but this surely is a novel application of the Rawlsian construct to the Hindu notion of the cycle of rebirth till one attains Nirvana. But this was typical IG. As a semi-autobiographical book reveals, IG's main preoccupations as a civil servant in North Block was to oversee day-to-day -day economic decision making. But there were important policy issues as well which required careful deliberation where one's basic training in micro and macroeconomics certainly would have come in handy. Following the Chinese war, the government came up with the World Control Order. I'm talking about 62. The government comes up with the World Control Order. IG was then the chief economic advisor and was one of the ardent proponents of the World Control Order. He was identified with it. The idea was to put a curb on purchase and hoarding of gold jewelry or bullion. The policy, however, was a miserable failure. This was a case of standard economic reasoning clashing with the age-old Indian proclivity sanctioned by social custom to splurge on jewelry, especially during marriage, but also on other social and religious occasions. By a long margin, Indians are the biggest consumers of gold. Okay, so no matter what you do by way of government policy, people will simply go ahead and purchase, buy gold. Not only the rich, the middle class and the poor as well. Because the, even the poor woman in a village knows that this is the best way to think in terms of her wealth. And its value will keep on increasing. So this is a sh sure way to, you know, keep your money in the best possible form. If you only keep uh, currency notes, with inflation, its value will go down, but not gold. The price of gold will go apace with inflation, but even faster than the pace of inflation. So it's, it's, it's a good rational economic thinking. There were some notable, I'm not going to read the full lecture, I'm afraid, but I will suitably, I'll take another five or ten minutes and I'll conclude. So this is the, my conclusion time. I'll take another 5 to 10 minutes. In any case, I started 20 minutes after. So I'll suitably read from my lecture uh, some events which uh, throw some light on IG. And I'll also say something about what I have to say on this particular topic, which I'll briefly say. 
also. But I would leave it to you since the lecture has been given. You please read it and think about it on your own. So there were some notable situations where IG found himself at the very center of decision making at the highest levels. This was much later, after the gold control order and so on. He continued in the Indian government. That policy was a failure, but there were many other policy interventions during which IG was a key central person. So now I'm talking about one of those. On 19th July 1969, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, as the Prime Minister, took the political decision of nationalizing the banks. Everyone knows that, bank nationalization. IG was the Secretary for Economic Affairs. A day earlier, that is 18th July 69, he was summoned by Mrs. Gandhi to prepare within 24 hours the bill, a note for the cabinet, and a speech for the Prime Minister to make to the nation on the radio. This had to be done with utmost confidentiality. IG immediately requested the RBI governor, L.K. Jha, to take the first flight to Delhi and to bring along with him a certain Mr. R.K. Shishadri, an RBI officer who was with the Ministry of Finance earlier during Finance Minister T.T. Krishnamachari's time and who, along with IG, had prepared a draft note for nationalizing banks at the instance of the minister, that is TTK. So they had considered it but had not implemented it. So there was a note already. IG knew about it. This officer had gone to Bombay. So he asked L.K. Jha to come along with this officer to Delhi. On 18 July 69, IG along with Governor Jha and Mr. Sheshadri worked through the night, through the night, and prepared a draft bill and selected 14 banks for nationalization, which between them accounted for some 85% of the deposits. The task was the exacting one of having to provide all the justifications in simple terms for the cabinet and the country also. IG could be counted upon to perform this task and he did so with his usual panache. So all through his years as a civil servant in North Bloc as well as the governor of the RBI, the key concern of IG was of course to formulate those policies that would best maintain growth with price stability and social justice. This was his key concern. By the time his governorship in the RBI was coming to a close, the command structure of planning had already come into a fair amount of disrepute. I'm talking about the year 1982. Srimati Indira Gandhi had returned to power as the Prime Minister after the brief Janta interregnum, and some amount of opening up of the economy was already being seen as the need of the hour. The three decade long span of the Hindu rate of growth was over and with some freeing up of the economy, the growth rate of the GDP seemed to be inching up, up a bit. IG's active involvement with the decision making process came to an end with the end of his five year term as governor of RBI. From here, he moved to a new avatar of being an educationist and taking up the job of being the director first of the Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad for two years and then of the iconic London School of Economics for six. IG, was, IG has admitted that he never expected the LSC position. It came as a surprise but clearly the search committee had done its due diligence and was sufficiently impressed with his credentials, which were admittedly considerable. In 1990, at the age of 66, IG returned to his birthplace, Vadodara, to lead a well-earned, quiet and retired life. The country's economic scenario was precarious. I'm talking about 
the years 1991, that particular phase. Okay, you try to recall Rajiv Gandhi's prime ministership ending, then VP Singh becomes the prime minister. All of you recall those Bofors days, VP Singh becomes prime minister. He did not last a year, did not last a full year. Then Chandrasekhar becomes prime minister. He lasted about seven months, Chandrasekhar. And then the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi and Congress party returns to power <coughs> with majority and Manmohan Singh, uh, sorry, uh, P.V. Narasimha Rao being asked to be the Prime Minister and he picks Dr. Manmohan Singh but there's a, there's a further twist to that when Narasimha Rao comes as the Prime Minister in 91 June the economy was in such a dire strait. The fisc, that is the fiscal part of the economy, a terrible situation. Too much overspending, populist overspending, too little tax revenue. <coughs> fiscal deficit was too high, almost 10% plus. It's too high. These days we are talking about 3%. Of course, this 10% was central plus state uh, fiscal deficit put together which now is in the range of about 7-8 percent but at that time it had tipped 10 percent and gone, gone beyond and foreign exchange you know the extent of foreign exchange was adequate only to buy two weeks of our two weeks of our imports I'm talking about 91 whereas the uh, extent of foreign exchange that you really need should be at least five to six months worth of imports you know, we import oil and this and that and so forth. Oil being a very critical um, uh, product, uh, good that, that we import. It was only for two weeks worth of imports that we had. So that's the position that Narasimha Rao found himself in. So what does he do? Well, he thinks in terms of completely changing the economic sort of policy making scenario. This was his decision. And he figured that, well, things are so bad that it can't get any worse. So let me now abandon the earlier thing. Let me open up in a, in a major way. But who does he think of, Narasimha Rao, to, and the first task is to pick a finance minister. Who does he pick? Well, he had two names with him. The first name was IG. It was not Manmohan Singh. The first name was IG. IG was spoken to. It was broached to him. But for a variety of reasons, IG declined. It might have had to do with IG's extremely high profile positions that he already had held and the political uncertainty that he saw before him. Rajiv Gandhi gone. V.P. Singh, less than a year, Chandrasekhar, seven months. Um, then assassination of Rajiv Gandhi. Narasimha Rao comes in, asks him to come in. He probably didn't want to get into this kind of setting. And for whatever reason, he says no. And Dr. Manmohan Singh, who too had had a very illustrious kind of career, and at that time, he had accepted the position of being UGC chairperson not a particularly great position. If you look at the top, you know, uh, RBI governor is one kind of position in these so-called hierarchy of positions. UGC top uh, chairman is, is a good position, but not in that uh, stratospheric range. No, not that. John Shaker had made him. Uh, before this, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh had been in the Summit Commission and had a very major sort of input there, he was in Geneva, he comes back, uh, he was given this, he was first uh, advisor to the Prime Minister and then he was given this particular position, chairperson, chair, chairman of UGC. So with IG turning it down, the job goes to Dr. Manmohan Singh and then the rest is, as you know, Dr. Manmohan Singh had the full backing of Prime Minister Narasimha Rao and the point I want to make is that oftentimes we think of reforms as something that Dr. Manmohan Singh brought in. 
But I want to emphasize that the political will and the clear vision definitely was one which Narasimha Rao had and he imparted and advised Dr. Manmohan Singh on that and together they took it forward. So, uh, friends, I will speak only for two minutes on the main theme that I really want to. This is in the second and third. I will give you the gist of what I try to say in that. I will not be able to read it. There's no time. Yeah. I don't want to, uh, you know, upset the the the, the sequence. Etc. What I'm trying to say is that I'm taking the growth experience of India. I am to cut a very long story short. The growth experience of India is a steady progression from, if you look at 1900 to 1950, during the colonial phase till 1947, growth rate of barely 1%, less than 1%. During 50 to 80, 30 years, first the early part of Nehruvian socialism, etc., the growth rate is about Three and a half percent or so, the so called Hindu rate of growth. <coughs> then the 80s, we are slowly opening up, growth rate increases about 5 percent. Then the reforms brought in in 1991 with Narasimha Rao, Dr. Manmohan Singh, Ajay Patel is really watching it from Broda at that stage. Uh, because in 90 he returns and sort of is not really taking on anything major. Growth rate is about six, six and a half percent. So, in the when we come to the 2000 to 2010, the growth rate for three years, as you all know, 2005, six, six, seven, and seven, eight, it goes beyond nine percent. So that is the point at which the Indian growth really goes into a new zone. Nine percent plus. Nobody in the 50s or 60s could ever have imagined that India could possibly go at that kind of rate. What to speak of the 50s, even in the early 90s, nobody could have imagined. But it did happen. It did happen for a number of uh, important conjunctions. One of which is India's savings rate by the late 1990s, beginning to 2000 had already become quite appreciable. In 2006, we were saving around 36 percent, which was a fantastic savings rate. And if you adopt a very simple Harad Domar kind of structure, capital output ratio around 4, then if you save and invest about 36, 37 percent, you straight away have 36 divided, divided by 4, about 9 percent crude. This is a crude formulation. If you have some uh, difficulties like some constraints, then this 9% will be that much less. It can be 8 to 7 and a half or so. But if there are no major constraints, then the crude formulation of the Harad Domar model will give you a straight away 9% rate of growth. Well, that is precisely what we achieved. But then 2008, I don't have to spend time. All of you know that the, by this time the Indian economy was, was already getting integrated in certain ways with the US and the European economies the IT sector in particular. A lot of our Gurgaon, Bangalore, young boys and girls, they were into the software, also some kind of hardware industry, and they were feeding into the US and European economies. But 2008 broke all of that. And with those economies very badly hit by the financial crisis, when the orders dried up, so our economy took a hit. And our growth rate went down down to as low as about 5% and in fact dipped a little bit below it. So, the point of what I try to say is that in terms of growth rate again we are back to what? About 7.5% right now. We have tipped the Chinese growth rate, China out around 7.1%. And if you look at the advanced countries, they as a whole are growing around 2% or so. I'm talking about past year. And if you look at all developing countries, the growth rate is around 4%. So if you look at the total picture, and let me tell you one more thing, there are some countries, including 
important countries like Brazil and Russia, last year, you can check, they had a negative growth rate. Brazil and Russia, these are two important countries in the BRICS, BRICS group. They had a negative growth rate. So in this scenario, for a country like India to record a 7.5% growth is, is very good. Is very good. And of course, with the right kind of husbanding of resources and managing things, we can expect to go and grow at about 8% or so. But I am now raising a caveat. This 8% kind of growth and the earlier 9% growth can come about even when the growth is concentrated in the top 5 to 10% of the population, the top IT sector and the services sector. And this can happen with the bottom 30-40% of the population being completely untouched when the growth is. So I am making a plea and a case for having a growth as high as is possible, yes, but focusing on the bottom 30% in a much more important way. So that is what I am trying to focus on. And towards that, much more emphasis on investment into the agriculture sector, which we are neglecting. Public investment into the agriculture sector. Another aspect, social sector. For everything that we are doing, it's very good that we are having good growth of private colleges and men's colleges and so forth. But there is a need for a solid public component in higher education, also medical education and health. I'll give you just one statistic. Public expenditure, public expenditure on health in India is 1.3% of GDP. Okay? China, it is 2.9%. And if you look at Western Europe, it is 8 to 10%. Netherlands is more than 10%. We are still stuck at 1.3%. Now, what one is trying to say, it is one of the lowest and it is a shameful record for us. We have to increase this. So, we simply cannot be happy about having a growth rate of 7, 8 or 9 percent. We can achieve 8 percent, not a problem. But this 8 percent has to be qualified with much more emphasis on growth tapering down the bottom 20 percent. And the public sector has to do much more, but the government also has to do much more. I try to give certain proposals and certain ideas towards that. So that is the theme of my lecture. I will then end with many other things that I have to say about IG's personality and his life in the very final section, but I have no time for that. So thank you very much. That's